This is the last recorded video for ch the Chapter 6 lectures. Um, I just wanted to mention to you that there are a lot of bone markings um, as we go through individual bones in the skeleton. Um, I, I'm really going to just um, focus on ones you may have a question about in, you know, on the exam or, or in your activities that you do in mastering. Um, so on this page, I would just say that the ver vertebral foramen, a foramen is just a large hole through bone. So this is a typical um, vertebra, um, a cervical vertebra. So the vertebral foramen through any of the vertebra, the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, it doesn't matter. The vertebral foramen is the place where the spinal cord um, resides. Okay, so I would expect you to know that. So that's a bone marking that um, serves, you know, for for something to travel through, like a, a a nerve, or in this case, it's the entire spinal cord. Um, but a nerve or blood vessels or whatever would travel through a foramen. Um, and then the spinous process is the name given to the structure that causes it that forms bumps that can be felt along the midline of the back. So when you run your fingers down someone's back and you feel those bumps, that's the spinous processes, um, which are these structures here. So they, this it would be these structures that cause the bumps in your back. So um, also know that the first two cervical vertebrae are called the atlas and the axis. And together they allow you to um, nod your head. Well, sorry, they allow you, they allow you to um, shake your head no, the atlas and the axis. But the articulation between the atlas, which is C1, this one here, and the occipital bone is what allows you to nod your head yes. So nodding yes is the atlas and the occipital bone and shaking no is the atlas and the axis. Okay, let's look at the ribs now, um, or actually the entire thoracic cage. You have the sternum, which is composed of this portion up top, or the superior portion is called the manubrium. This is the body of the sternum, and then this part is the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process is the structure that's sometimes damaged um, when someone, when you're giving CPR to someone. Um, it's often damaged. So, this, this entire manubrium body and xiphoid process composes the sternum or breastbone. And then we have 12 pairs of ribs. So the first seven pairs of ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these are true ribs because they're directly connected to the sternum by um, costal cartilages. But the other ribs, the false ribs, either aren't connected at all which would be the floating ribs down here, pairs 11 and 12. They aren't connected to the sternum at all. Or you have the false ribs that start with pair 8. They are pairs 8, 9, and 10 that are connected, but it's kind of an indirect connection. You have cartilage that connects to the cartilage that's directly attached to the um, sternum. So they're, they're not directly attached like pairs 1 through 7 are. They're indirectly attached. So they're called false ribs. Um, eight pa pairs 8 through 12 are false ribs, and then specifically pairs 11 through 12 are floating ribs. And the pectoral girdle, also called the shoulder girdle, consists of the clavicle and the scapula, which is the collarbone and the shoulder blade. This is what they, those bones look like. Um, this is the humerus, which is found in the arm or the brachial region. Uh, 
the elbow is formed by the bone marking called the olecranon. The radius and the ulna are the forearm bones in, in, or an, in the antibrachial region, and you can always tell where they are because the radius will be along the same side as the thumb, and the ulna will be along the same side as the little finger or the um, pinky. Then you have the um, carpals, which are the bones of the wrist. You don't have to know the names of the individual carpals. You can see the radius here alongside the thumb and the ulna alongside the pinky. The bones of the palm are the metacarpals, and then the um, finger bones are called the phalanges. Let's see. Um, I do want you to know the difference between a male and female pelvis. So let's go over the, the parts first. The bones of the pelvis, on either side you have this wide, um, larger portion of the pelvis, which is called the ilium. And then you have the ischium and the pubis. The pubis is the part that connects here in the center at this piece of cartilage called the pubic, pubic symphysis. Um, the ischium has, I do want to mention the structures on the ischium. I think I can. Well, here, here it is. Okay, the ischial tuberosity is what we sometimes call our sitting bones. These are the bones you actually are putting pressure on when you sit in a chair. So the ischial tuberosity is the structure that we sit on of our pelvis. And so here we have the difference between the male and female pelvis. And you could probably have looked and you could decide for yourself that this was female and this was male. But if we measure these angles and we measure the distances, um, the pelvic outlet here is going to be much broader. And there's also sp more space from the um, anterior to posterior. So front to back, there's more space in here. This whole pelvic outlet is a, is a larger area, as you would expect would be needed, you know, so the, um, the baby can come through the birth canal. And it's a smaller area in the males. And this angle here between um, the pubic bones is 90 degrees or less in the male pelvis, and it's 100 degrees or more. It's a wider angle in the female pelvis. Okay, so we have the lower limb. This is the femur. You can always tell it, tell it because of the um, large neck uh, portion. So this is the femur. Um, and then the, the leg bones, which would be the lower leg. The femur would be the thigh bone. And then the leg bones would be the fibula, which is on the lateral side, and the tibia, which is your shin bone. And then your ankle bones are the tarsals. Now we're going to go into a section on the uh, joints. You just need to know that a joint can be classified as synarthrosis, meaning there's no movement between the bones of that joint, and amphiarthrosis, which means there's little movement, or the ones that we are more um, familiar with are the diarthrosis joints, which permit free movement. Diarthrosis joint is the functional category of the joint, whereas structurally we call it a synovial joint. But a synovial joint is always a diarthrosis joint. So they're always, synovial and diarthrosis always are, the, are if a joint is called diarthrosis, it's always synovial and it permits free movement. So these will be the freely movable joints like our knee and our hip and our shoulder and our elbow, um, finger joints, you know, those kinds of things. Now, the ones that permit no movement, um, one of the synarthrosis is called a suture, and it's a fibrous joint between the bones of the skull, permits no movement. A gomphosis, which is um, between the teeth and their sockets, um, And that's also a fibrous synarthrosis. And then a synchondrosis is a cartilaginous synarthrosis. And we see that um, with our epiphyseal plate or epiphyseal cartilage and also between the first pair of ribs and the sternum. Then we have little movement. So there's, the, there's a syndesmosis, amphiarthrosis, which is um, 
the ligament between the tibia and the fibula. And then we have a symphysis, which is the pubic symphysis between the two um, pubic uh, bones and um, also the vertebral disc. Those are symphysis joints. And you have the definitions here. You can read through them, but I think the table is probably the best. Um, and then we have a, a little bit more information on the diarthrosis joints or the um, synovial joints. And just for a typical one, you can see that there is a joint capsule. So you've got two bones that come together at that joint usually, and then there's a joint capsule that surrounds the entire joint. The ends of the bones that come together are protected by articular cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage. There's a joint cavity that contains synovial fluid and a synovial membrane. And then this is the um, knee joint. So you can see additional structures that provide support, protection, stability, that kind of thing. Um, we can see the bursa. Bursa are just um, membranes that are filled with fluid. So you see. Um, People get bursitis or inflammation of the bursa, and, and that's common in the shoulder and the elbow and the knee. Um, but, but these are just extra pads of fluid, um, packets of connective tissue containing synovial fluid. They reduce friction and absorb shock. Then we have several ligaments in the knee. You might be familiar with the um, anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. They form a cross, um, which is why they're called cruciate ligaments. Um, they're not shown in this picture, so I'll show you another, another slide that shows you the picture of the cruciate ligaments. Um, the menisci in the knee, or, or singular is meniscus, these are like little triangle, um, triangular um, sections of really tough fibrocartilage that provide some um, st stability. Then you have fat pads for shock absorption. Um, ligaments join bone to bone. There's a lot of ligaments in the knee for stability. And uh, do we not have another picture? Okay, well, I'll just have to tell you. So the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, this just shows you a little piece of one, but what they do is they attach the tibia and the femur. Um, and they're, you, Sometimes when you get those injured, they're, it's called the anterior cruciate ligament is very commonly injured in sports like soccer and basketball. If you ever hear someone has an ACL tear, that's a bad injury. Um, it takes a while to recover from it. Can be, you, they can have surgery and they can play again. Um, a few years back, uh, they, they wouldn't have been able to, but, but surgery has improved and technology has improved. Um, you do need to know the different movements at joints. You need to know, like for abduction and adduction. Abduction would be, for example, um, moving the arm laterally away from the body. And then adduction, I always think of it as I'm adding it back. So if I move my arm back to my side or my leg back to my side, that's adduction. Um, you can do circumduction with your arm draw a circle with your arm. That's, that's um, a movement permitted at the shoulder joint. You can also do it with your leg, just not as good. Rotation means spinning on the axis. So you, when you rotate at your shoulder joint, um, you're, you're just kind of twisting that shoulder. You're not drawing a circle with your arm. You're twisting that shoulder joint. Um, pronation means moving your palm to where your palm is down and supination is when your palm is up so if you're in the anatomical position supination is how your arm would be um, and then if you turn your palm over where your palm is facing toward the posterior toward your back that's pronation um, and these movements are important for opening jars then we have special movements inversion is when you take the sole of your foot and you kind of um, kind of turn it so that um, it's turned. Hold on. So for inversion, you're basically putting your weight on the lateral portion, the side of your foot, and um, turning it inward. 
And it's not, it's not real easy to do, but you can do it. And eversion is the opposite of that. You're putting your weight on the inside medial portion of your foot and turning it um, outward. Okay, so um, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are easier to explain. So dorsiflexion would be if you were rocking back on the heels of your foot and plantar flexion would be if you were standing on your tiptoes. Um, the okay so opposition and reposition involves the thumb if you take your thumb and touch it to your pinky that's opposition and when you take it away it's called reposition now elevation and depression um think about your jaw and what's happening with your jaw when you close your mouth that's actually elevation and when you open your mouth that would be depression Okay, and then lateral flexion is if you bend your whole entire trunk to the side, you're bending at your waist. And I'll just say that we have two ball and socket joints. That's our hip joint and our um, shoulder joint. And as far as the shoulder joint, it is the most frequently dislocated joint. It has the greatest range of motion of any of our joints. Um, the stability of the joint is sacrificed for mobility. And we also have the hip joint, which is an extremely stable joint, um, but it's not doesn't have the mobility that the sh shoulder joint does. And then there's a little bit of information on the knee joint. Here, here are the pictures I was looking for. Here's your um, your ACL and your and your uh, PCL. See how they cross ACL, PCL, and and they um, basically they hold together the tibia and the um, the femur. Cruciate ligaments attach the tibia to the femur. Yeah. Okay. That is it. It was a long chapter. <laughs>